All right, welcome everybody. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a talk I've been wanting to put on for about a year and I've spent about that same amount of time editing it and tweaking, tweaking it and making sure that it made as much sense as I possibly could make it. So first off, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is this talk's going to be about magnetic resonance imaging or MRIs and we're going to be talking about the science behind it, what it actually means when you see an MRI or get an MRI, what's happening, what sort of image is actually coming out of it. And we're going to be discussing how this image compares to things like a photograph, which is our inherent visual or thought when we talk about an image, we think of a photograph. Um, how it's similar, how it's different, we're going to talk about how light actually interacts with um, different types of tissue and, and what that means in, in sense of the science. So thank you all so much for, for joining and hopefully you guys enjoy this. Uh, since I'm going to be the one that you all are listening to for the next hour or so, I do want to give you a little bit about my background. Uh, I have spent much of my time, uh, my last better part of a decade, on the subject of imaging in some way, shape, or form. Uh, that said, I am by no means a radiologist, or do I consider myself an expert, but I refer to myself as an enthused hobbyist who has a bit of experience. Uh, that experience has it began in something called fluorescent imaging on uh, rodent tissue, specifically mouse tissue and a little bit of rat tissue. Basically, I would get tissue and I'd insert it into what basically looked like a microwave and app, and it would shoot light at it and record some almost like a Polaroid and it would give it back to you. Um, after that, that was kind of a, a kind of low end version of imaging. It was very simplistic. Uh, the information you got out was uh, at the tissue level uh, and you had to do a bit of... Um, uh, you weren't really looking at a whole structure. You were kind of grinding up tissue and, and getting information about proteins and things like that. Uh, I then moved into functional brain imaging, uh, so which is much more, um, I'll say, fancy and a little bit more to it um, on the kind of whole spectrum of things. And I used something called FNIRS, which stands for Functional Near Infrared Spectroscopy. It was essentially a funny looking hat that you could use and walk around and it would actually record your brain activity using near infrared light. I also used other sort of forms of imaging directly or at least studied them uh, for a period of time because I had to work with groups that um, use them. So I used EEG, eye tracking, eye, uh, movement tracking, uh, worked with folks doing MRI and PET and SPECT and just about every sort of imaging you could imagine. Uh, this has been my favorite topic uh, that I could talk to for hours on. Uh, what I really enjoy doing is breaking it down into what's actually going on. So... With the MRI, uh, we're going to be talking about a few things. First, as I mentioned, how does this compare to a photo of the body? When you see an MRI image, how do, what does that mean in relation to me taking an image of the body itself? And how that image that we're getting from the MRI is really inherently tricking our eyes. And really the photograph is doing that too. So we're going to be talking about um, our eyes. What is it about our eyes that allows this trickery to occur? And then... That, that trickery, what does that actually say about light? And, and we're going to dig into light itself. Um, with the light, uh, it does interact with specific molecules and, and different aspects of the body that will actually give us this image. So we're going to talk about how that happens. And then finally, we're going to discuss an MRI slice. If anybody's worked in MRI or been around MRI, you'll always hear the term MRI slice or slices or scroll through the slices or something like that. We're going to discuss what the term slice actually means and how these slices are created. So to start, let's begin with something we really kind of get. So we're going to talk about a photography. We're going to talk about a photograph. Specifically, we're going to talk about a digital photograph. There's also like an analog photograph, essentially a Polaroid. Um, doesn't really take a computer in a sense. Uh, it's just a recording on a light-sensitive uh, fabric or um, screen and it prints out directly. We're not going to be talking about that because almost all imaging we do nowadays is digital. So we're going to be talking about how it's input into a computer and, and put out. So on the right here you're going to see a photograph of a brain. And on the left you see an MRI of a brain. They're two different brains but aside from that they look pretty similar. Other than of course the MRI being black and white and gray in between and the photograph having color. So they look pretty similar. Our eyes kind of perceive them. We know those are related in some way. 
Well, the photograph is going to be using visible light. The MRI will not, and we'll talk about what the MRI is using. But essentially, you're using the rainbow. And the photograph itself is kind of has two components. It has brightness, which is going to be how much light is really bouncing off of different parts of the object. So some parts will be brighter, some parts will be darker. And then, of course, it's going to have color as well. Uh, for the brightness, I always like to refer to it as the opposite of the shadow because you essentially have light. If you were to stand in front of a light, you'd have light that would hit you. You'd have a shadow behind you. And the light that hits you would bounce in the opposite direction of the shadow. So they're kind of like two sides to the same coin, if you will. And the MRI is also an imaging technique, but, and, and photography is also an imaging technique, but it's very different in how it's created and how it behaves. With the photography, you have the light and the dark, and you have the color, as I mentioned. I have this photograph here. Uh, this is in Houston. It's Herman Park. And what you see in the buildings in the background is the Texas Medical Center. Uh, it's one of, I think it's the largest medical center in the world, if I'm not mistaken. But even if it's not, it's a very large medical center. And right next to it is Herman Park. Very nice park. You have a zoo. You have a train and golf course and all that. Those are my stepdaughters standing at the water. I think they're looking at some ducks probably. Um, and what I, the reason I'm using this image here is you have a few components to it. First, you have the sun that's setting. And you can see the sun is emitting light, right? You can even see the rays of light coming out from the sun. The light is emitting photons. It's emitting pieces of light that's shooting out in all directions. And that is a source of brightness in the image. But you also have the water here that looks pretty bright, right? It's a light color in the image. But the, the water is not emitting any light. It's merely reflecting the light from the sun. So you can have brightness for two different reasons. One, it's emitting it, a light bulb for, per se. And two, it's reflecting it. That would be, let's say, a mirror. Then you're also going to have areas of the photograph that are dark. These are places where the light is not being emitted or reflected. It's being absorbed. So the light is basically disappearing into the, the darkness here. But you don't just have light and dark. You have color as well. And in most photographs, in most phones, in most computer screens, most TVs, you have three layers of color. You have a red layer, you have a green layer, and you have a blue layer. And normally those are the only three layers we use. There's going to be a reason for that. Some different uh, TVs or some different phones or things like that, we use multiple layers beyond that. Uh, but for the most part, red, green, and blue will suffice and are used very, very widely. An example of that is this image here of my, my kids' toys. So this is one of those little block building sets you can build, you know, whatever with the, what is it, a hexagon, a little trapezoid, a diamond, square, triangle. You have these little shapes you can configure, and they're all different colors. Well, if you zoom in on that, and there's actually a website you can, you can use to, to create this kind of effect to give you an idea of what's going on. It's called think-math.co.uk. They also have stand-up comedy about... Um, math so, or spreadsheets and it's it's actually quite entertaining um, if you go there there's this dash spreadsheet or backslash ba spreadsheet where you can take a photograph load it in and it will print out an excel spreadsheet for you that spreadsheet has three rows if you zoom in close enough there's a green row a blue row or a red row and a blue row each one of those cells there you see kind of if you look closely enough there's a number printed on it the higher the number the brighter that color is at that cell so the darker numbers will have lower, uh, uh, darker, sorry, the lower numbers will have darker cells, and the higher numbers will have brighter cells. If you zoom out, you can kind of get that picture again, and here is that original picture. If you, do, if you think this is just trickery with Excel spreadsheets, you can also put a little water droplet on your phone, and you'll actually, it kind of acts like a magnifying glass, and you'll see the same effect occur. You'll actually see the multiple rows of color. But you'll notice we don't just have red and green and blue in this image. There's a lot of color. There's the granite here is kind of a brownish tan. You have orange. You have uh, yellow here. But if you zoom in, all of those colors were created using this. So it's very kind of strange. Um, it's also not primary colors. You know, you kind of think, well, those are primary colors. Well, it's, primary is yellow, blue, and red. But here we have green. We don't have yellow. So it's not just primary colors. It's, it's kind of this trickery that we have built into all this technology, but it works. The reason it works is because of the way our eye works. Uh, so we, we use these three layers, RGB. If you look over here at the eye, what we've done is zoom in on the retina. And you have two different types of cells. One's called a cone cell and one's called a rod cell. The rod cells, which are these kind of black and white ones, and it's not really black and white. We've color coded it to, uh, to make sense here. 
the uh, rod cells are responsible for seeing brightness and darkness in dimly lit areas for low light situations. And they happen to be located kind of out of your focal point on your eye. So if you're ever in the dark and you see kind of a shimmering star or you see something out of the corner of your eye, which is this whole saying, when you turn to look at it, sometimes you won't see it anymore. But if you rotate your eye a little off again, you'll see it again. The reason for that is these black and white, these kind of dimly lit situation cells are located kind of in the corner of our eye. The cone cells, which are responsible for seeing color, is located in the focal point. So these are great during the day when there's a lot of light coming in, but they're bad in low light situations, which is why you have to tilt your eye slightly away to see those dimly lit things. And it just so happens these cone cells have three different varieties, and they happen to be red, green, and blue. The reason they're red, we call them red, green, and blue, they're not, again, not color-coded like that in your actual eye, but we have this little histogram here, and we essentially have our blue cone, our green cone, and our red cone. These peaks here are basically stating that this cone can see blue wavelengths of light, or blue light, really, really well, but not so well on any of the other colors. Green sees the green and the yellow pretty well, a little bit of blue, a little bit of red, but mostly green. The red sees that red, yellow, and orange really well. So we've kind of simplified it, obviously. You see a blending of color, but I would call it red. Um, but that's what our, these cells see. What's nice about that is you can kind of modify the amount of light at these different colors that's being shown in, and that mixture will form other colors, which causes us to see that full rainbow. What this is telling you, or what you kind of should be wrapping your eye around, is that these photographs that we see, or these images that we see, or anything that we see here, are models of the world. We're not, you know, we, we're not seeing a direct image. It's kind of these lights that's shining into things. It's interacting with molecules and it's shooting back to our eye and our eye kind of simplifies the structure. The camera's doing it as well. The photographs are doing it as well. They're simplifying the environment around us. And it's simplifying in a sense to help us survive. You know, this is, if we were overwhelmed with too much information, we would have to think way too much and we would act way too little. So we've simplified it just enough. We can act on it. We can behave on it. And we do quite fine. Um, but it's a model. And it, if you don't really believe that statement, if you've ever tried to take a photograph of the night sky and you have these wonderful stars throughout the sky and you have, get your phone out, if you get a really nice camera, it might work, but you get your phone out, take a photo of the, the sky, and you get a black screen. But you look up, and there's all these stars. And then you look down, and it's a black screen. You look up, it's all these stars. It's not the same. They're clearly different. So you're getting this model that isn't quite accurate enough. On a quick tangent, we have three of these cones in our, in our eyes. We have the red, the green, and blue. There's an, a few animals, but this one in particular called the mantis shrimp. And you can see he's brightly colored. He's also very aggressive, and he happens to have the fastest punch of, of I think, all animals, pound for pound. Uh, he can break a glass uh, uh, aquarium uh, with his punch. But the mantis shrimp has 12 of these cone cells, and they might not be called cone cells, but they do the same thing. So instead of having three, where we can kind of mix and match three different varieties, they can mix and match 12. And there's a really nice YouTube uh, channel. It, uh, he does um, kind of joking uh, National Geographic style documentaries. But it's called Z Frank or Zay Frank, however you pronounce it. And in talking about the mantis shrimp, he comments, imagine a color you can't even imagine. Now do that nine more times. And what gets me there is, if you just pause and think about that for a second, try to imagine a color you can't imagine. If you imagine it, that's you didn't follow the rules. So it should hurt your brain a little bit. These mantis shrimp can see color that we can't even fathom, uh, that we aren't even aware or it would be a possibility. So that's a pretty wild way to view that. Going back to that model of thought, this should kind of clean up that, that initial or close that initial thought. We have two individuals that have been photographed in two different lighting circumstances. This top one is me. I, I'm not the most handsome photograph I've ever taken. This bottom one is uh, this woman that had a much, much better version of the, the attempt that I'm having here. The goal is both of these are the same people. 
but the lighting has changed and the image itself has changed drastically. Which image do you think better represents the individual? And that should be a hard thing to, to answer because your initial answer would be, oh, they both do. But if you had to pick one, which one represents the individual more, uh, more, <laughs> more better? Which one represents the individual better? And you sh there's really no answer. Uh, it's the same person which means that the image you're getting on a photograph is highly dependent on external, the external environment, where the light is, uh, what's going on with that environment around them. And that means that the image you're getting is mostly true. It is the model. It is dependent on light. And that's what we're going to dive into next. So these photographs are the best model that we can create for our reality, but we have to use light to obtain them. So in using light, we need to know a little bit about it. And light is one of the most mysterious things you could ever encounter. And yet it's everywhere. There's no escaping this. Light is the output of what's called an electromagnetic wave. The electro means electrical. The magnetic obviously means magnet. Electricity is just the movement of electrons. So you have all these wires going in and out of your house. They allow the flow of electrons. And the flow of electrons can be used for energy, and you can use them to turn motors and things like that. You turn on your lights with this and everything. This is electricity, simply the movement of electrons. Magnetism is the attraction or the repulsion of electrons and protons. So going back to basic chemistry, you have an, a, an atom. The atom has protons in the middle and electrons floating around the outside. And those are your charges, right? So essentially, light will be the result of these moving charges. And when I say moving, note this image here on the right. And I'm not going to play the video. Uh, the, the image, I think, clears it up pretty well. Imagine this negative and positive flipping sides back and forth. They're kind of rotating. As they rotate, they kind of create these little pinched off uh, waves. They're creating these waves that are kind of pronounced and they're moving out from away, uh, out away from the, um, the charges here. These are your electromagnetic waves. They are both, they're two-sided. There's an electrical wave, and in addition to that, at a 90 degree angle, so if, if you flip it sideways, there's an, a magnetic wave, and they go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other, as far as we know. So, inevitably, everyone asks, or is it electrical or is it magnetic? Because in our minds, these two things are the exact same. They are both. You're not going to be able to separate these two, and you can't really discuss one without discussing the other. And there's a terrific explanation by Richard Feynman, which I'm going to pull up here in, in just a second. This is Richard Feynman on the on the right. He's a Nobel Prize winning physicist and an amazing personality of a scientist if you ever uh, find yourself in the, the rabbit hole of YouTube. Uh, he has a comment in the video that you're not at all disturbed by the fact that when you put your hand on a chair, it pushes you back. And he'll go in to discuss what he means by that, so I'll open that up in a second. But what I want you to take away is that these moving charges are simply the electrons and protons of atoms and all electronics around us use this okay never mind it goes on and on now when you ask for example why two magnets repel there are many different levels it depends on whether you're a student of physics or an ordinary person that doesn't know anything or not if you're somebody who doesn't know anything at all about all Now, when you ask, for example, why two magnets repel, there are many different levels. It depends on whether you're a student of physics or an ordinary person that doesn't know anything or not. If you're somebody who doesn't know anything at all about it, all I can say is that there's a magnetic force that makes them repel and that you're feeling that force. And you say, but that's very strange because I don't feel kind of force like that in other circumstances. When you turn them the other way, they attract. There's a very analogous force, electrical force, which is the same kind of a question. And you say, that's also very weird. 
But you're not at all disturbed by the fact that when you put your hand on the chair, it pushes you back. But we found out by looking at it that that's the same force as a matter of fact, the electrical force, not magnetic exactly in that case, but it's the same electrical repulsions that are involved in keeping your finger away from the chair because everything's made out of its electrical forces in minor and microscopic details. There's other forces involved, but this is, is connected to electrical forces. It turns out that the magnetic and the electric force with which I wish to explain these things, this, this repulsion in the first place, is what ultimately is the deeper thing that we have to start, that we can start with, to explain many other things that looked like they were, everybody would just accept them. You know, you can't put your hand through the chair. That's taken for granted. But that you can't put your hand through the chair when looked at more closely. Why? It involves these same repulsive forces that appear in magnets. The situation you then have to explain is why in magnets it goes over a bigger distance than an ordinarily. And there it has to do with the fact that in iron, all the electrons are spinning in the same direction. They all get lined up, and they magnify the effect of the force until it's large enough at a distance that you can feel it. But it's a force which is present all the time and very common and is in a basic force of almost. I mean, I can go a little further back if I were more technical. But at an early level, I just have to, have to tell you that's going to be one of the things you'll just have to take as an element in the world, the existence of magnetic repulsion or electrical, or electrical attraction, magnetic attraction. I can't explain that attraction in terms of anything else that's familiar to you. For example, if we say the magnets attract like as if they were connected by rubber bands, I would be cheating you because they're not connected by rubber bands. I shouldn't be in trouble. You'd soon ask me about the nature of the bands. And secondly, if you were curious enough, you'd ask me why rubber bands tend to pull back together again, and I would end up explaining that in terms of electrical forces, which are the very things that I'm trying to use the rubber bands to explain, so I have cheated very badly, you see. Okay, so that was Richard Feynman explaining a, a magnet, essentially, and how a magnet and electricity are kind of one and the same. It's an electrical force that's kind of oriented in a particular way. I recommend that, that, that video in, in its full, by the way. It's, it's fantastic. It goes into aliens and ice and slipping and all sorts of things. But what I'm trying to focus on is that this electrical and this magnetic aspect are two sides of the same coin. You are not going to separate the two. And this electromagnetic combination creates what is called a positive feedback loop. So a positive feedback loop uh, is where when something starts happening, it gives feedback to itself, or could give feedback to something else, that causes the other thing to start happening. So an example would be you have a car and you're driving down the road, and as you accelerate, when the speedometer increases, it causes the car to accelerate faster. So if you start to accelerate, start speeding up, and as it speeds up, it causes this uh, gas pedal to go down harder, it speeds up further, causes the gas pedal to go down harder, and it just gets faster and faster and faster and faster. The opposite of that would be a negative feedback loop. Negative feedback loop is like a, a, a thermometer, or excuse me, a AC unit. When you have a thermostat, there you go, thermostat, where you have, you set the AC to 70 degrees, and what it's telling, uh, what it's telling the computer is saying, if it's over 70 degrees, turn on, when it's under 70 degrees, turn off. So it'll turn on until it hits 70 degrees. When it hits 70 degrees, it turns off. It starts to warm back up. It goes over 70, and it hit, turns back on. It says go back down under 70. Once it hits 70, it turns off. So a negative feedback loop is when you hit that goal, it turns off. A positive feedback loop is when you hit that goal, it turns back. It keeps going. It turns on more aggressively, if you will. So this is what a positive feedback loop means in the sense of an electromagnetic wave. Initially, these charges start to oscillate. It creates an electrical oscillation, which you're seeing in the blue here. It oscillates up, and then it oscillates down, and then it oscillates up, and then it oscillates down. And it goes back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. This oscillation of the electrical side creates an oscillation of the magnetic side, but you'll notice it's tilted. It's at like a 90 degree angle. Well, that starts going, and it gets created. And then you get an oscillation. That, that causes the oscillation of the electrical field again and it bounces back up and down. And the electrical field causes the oscillation of the magnetic field, and it bounces up and down. And they keep creating each other over and over and over, and they just go. And they go incredibly fast. 
they go 299,792,458 meters per second. If you convert that to miles per hour, that's 6.8 billion miles per hour, or seven and a half times around the Earth every second. This is as fast as you could ever imagine anything, and probably can't imagine anything moving this fast. And a lot of scientists have, have uh, theorized that if you were to travel faster than this, you travel faster than the speed of life, it would equate to time travel. You would arrive at a location before any information of your arrival had, ar had arrived at that uh, location. So you've, moved, you've basically gone forward in time. Or, from your standpoint, you're looking backwards in time. You are traveling through time. And it it's, gets even more complicated. So hopefully your brain's hurting a little bit now because this causes my brain to go into shock. But it gets even more complex. We have a light spectrum. You, it, light doesn't just come in one flavor. You have an enormous, almost infinite range of flavors here. These flavors start with the rainbow. You have the visible light here. And it's only a tiny sliver. And in fact, this isn't even to scale. It's much smaller than that. But it's a tiny sliver of what's actually out there. And when I told you your eyes simplify the world around you, this is part of it. There's a lot more information around you than what we're actually able to see. Beyond this visible light, you have ultraviolet light. If we move to the left, these wavelengths, as you can see, start going f uh, faster. That means that oscillation of the uh, positive and negative charge is moving faster. It's creating faster waves. They still travel at the same speed, but they, they oscillate faster. So you have ultraviolet. Ultraviolet comes from the sun. It causes skin cancer. I'm located in Texas. You get skin cancer fairly regularly if you have lighter skin, especially if you have lighter skin with dots. Um, but ultraviolet is slight, a, a fairly dangerous but invisible light form. Then we have x-rays. X-rays, again, invisible, but we can use it to image your, your bones. And it, ha it images your bones because bones are able to block it. Right? It, it interacts with bones and, and the bones absorb it. The problem with that is it's high energy and it can cause things like bone cancer. So you can't get too many x-rays in a short period of time. Then you have gamma rays, and gamma rays are also dangerous. They can be used for other things. There's a thing called a gamma knife, which can be used to attack tumors. Um, there's other things that use gamma rays as well, but again, dangerous, and it can cause cancer. As you move to the left here, all of these are high energy wavelengths. And in fact, if you ever get an x-ray, occasionally the radiology tech will discuss x-rays as being so many days worth or so many hours worth of sunlight. They're comparing the x-ray to sunlight because sunlight is radiation and can cause damage. And in fact, sunlight technically includes most of this light, if not all of this light, but things like x-rays get caught up in the atmosphere and they don't come through, luckily. Uh, ultraviolet comes through. Infrared comes through. Infrared's on the other side. Infrared is a longer wavelength. It's less dangerous. And it, we actually do sense it, even though we don't see it. But we sense it as heat. And so infrared, whenever you feel heat from the sun, normally you're feeling infrared on that. Other light can cause heat as well, but it's, using, it's not using radiation. It's usually something like conduction or something like that. But infrared we feel as heat. Microwaves are right located in the middle here. You wouldn't see that. But microwaves are um, used to cook food. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then you have radio waves. And for MRIs, that's where we're going to focus our attention. It's going to be radio waves. And we'll get there in a second. Beyond this, it's still weirder. We have the formula E equals MC squared. This is Einstein's famous formula. Uh, I think everyone here knows what this formula means, um, but probably haven't thought much about it. So E means energy. M, mass. And C is the speed of light. So it's combining these three components, and they're saying that both sides of this equation are equal. So E equals mc squared. If you use basic algebra, you can move these letters around. You could solve for m by dividing E by c squared. So you move c squared over here, and then you solve for mass. You can do the same for c squared by moving m over to the other side. You have a, a lot of variety you can play with here. But in, what you don't realize as you're doing the math, what this means is these things are convertible you can convert energy into mass and you can convert mass into energy and they're kind of the same thing and light is kind of the same thing as mass even though we don't relate it the same way first starts off 
is moving at Mach 100, 100 times the speed of sound. And then there is the mushroom-shaped cloud, which climbs into the sky, spewing radiation. That's directly tied to the nuclear fallout, which was very, very sensitive to the cloud height. So that was just a quick, uh, so that that was just a quick video to show you that what the atom bomb looks like. If you don't know what the atom bomb was, it was a tiny bit of radioactive mass, and because it's radioactive, they were able to basically create the mass moving at roughly the speed of light, which is converted to a massive amount of energy. So much energy it can destroy an entire city. So. Light is a strange, strange, strange thing. We don't really understand a lot about it, but we use it in everything, including our day-to-day -day life. And this light, the way we use it, is based on different types of light, different wavelength. When you look at things like plants, you, get, you see them as green. The reason you see them as green is because when light hits the plant, that light interacts with the plant. You see a rainbow hitting the plant, essentially white light. White light is a full rainbow. And it's, sh it's hitting the plant. Everything is absorbed by the plant except for the yellow and green. And the yellow and green bounces back. It's reflected back at your eye. This graph down here actually is showing that. So we have different types of chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is responsible for this process. And what this graph is showing is these high peaks is saying whatever this light is, is absorbed a lot. Whatever this light is, is absorbed a lot. Whatever this light is, it's almost at zero. It's not absorbed at all. It bounces back. And if you look down, it's green and yellow. Green and yellow is not absorbed at all. There's a tiny bit of orange that gets absorbed, but that kind of shoots back too. But once you get into red, it's all absorbed. This is how all of this, all of the light functions. Things are absorbed or they're bounced back. Infrared, we absorb it and we feel it as heat. UV, we absorb it and it interacts with our skin cells and can cause damage. Microwaves are, are the hydrogen molecules in food absorb it and they start to, to bounce around more, causing more heat. And if you ever, I don't re really recommend this because it can scald you, but you can put a cup of water in the microwave and a paper plate. The cup of water will get scalding hot and boiling, and even if you don't notice it's boiling, it can actually explode and cause a lot of uh, damage to you. Uh, but the paper plate will get like lukewarm, and it's simply because there's not many hydrogen molecules in a paper plate. But there's an excessive amount of hydrogen molecules in, in the water. And in MRI, we're going to be using radio waves. Radio waves also interact with hydrogen, and that's going to be our main focus. What you don't realize when you talk about radio waves is this is the same light that you use to listen to music in your car, and that's why it's called radio. You're not necessarily listening to the light uh, itself, but the light was used to transmit a signal. So the radio station will broadcast radio frequency light and embed little vibrations into those oscillate oscillations. And those little vibrations don't, don't affect the wavelength. It stays radio. But they have a built-in the, built code, a built-in signal that a, a, um, a computer can receive and decode and convert into vibrations. And those vibrations can be put into a speaker, and that speaker plays music to your ears. So that's how we actually listen to radio. With MRI, we're going to be using hydrogen molecules to create that signal. Um, but we're going to have to tweak them a bit. I do want to point out that we have, just to show you, here's a, an MRI image. This is actually my knee. You can see a screw right here. This is an infrared image. Infrared doesn't come in blue and pink and yellow. It comes in brightness because we don't. it doesn't have a color attached to it in reference to our eyes. So we embed our own colors into these, kind of like the storms, storm clouds. When you look at storm clouds on the news station, storm clouds don't have a color to them. We embed our own color so that we can understand it. And then microwaves can actually be used not just to cook food, but actually to look at the known universe. So we can use these for a lot of different uh, varieties. With MRI, and we jump into the radio waves, we're going to be discussing hydrogen. The reason we're discussing hydrogen is that it is an incredibly simple molecule. You have one proton and one electron. It's number one on the periodic table, if you remember that. 
which means that you have a positive charge in the middle and a negative charge floating around it really fast. Well, a positive and a negative charge creates a tiny, tiny, tiny little magnet. And now all of a sudden you have these little magnets floating around the body that you can use. And the body itself is about 60% water, which water is composed of a lot of hydrogen. So we have a lot of these. There is a significant amount of hydrogen molecules in the body. And depending on what type of tissue you're looking at, there's a differing amount. So fat has roughly, let's say, 10%. Muscle has about 70 to 75%. And bone has about 20 to 25%. So already we have these kind of telling factors that if only we can get them to work the way we want, they might be able to tell us a lot of information. Keep in mind that these numbers, the 60%, the 10%, these are rough estimates. That depending on the person uh, you're looking at or the person who tells you the numbers, they might differ a little bit. But these are pretty rough estimates. So we, this will give us access to a signal. But we got to do a little work first. That work is done using enormous, very expensive, very powerful magnets. This is the largest imaging magnet that we have created that I'm aware of. Uh, and it is located at the University of Minnesota. This magnet is registered, I believe, at 13 Tesla. And Tesla is a uh, measurement of uh, ma magnetism. The bigger the Tesla, the more magnetic it is. To give you an idea, when you go to an MRI and get one, let's say, of your knee, the magnet used there is about 1.5 Tesla. So this is about 10 times more powerful, and it, that's, that's if it's a linear um, uh, increase. Uh, I'm not sure if Tesla might even be logarithmic, which means it would be enormously more powerful. But what this enables us to do is place the body inside of this magnet. The magnet turns on, and these hydrogen magnets will align with the magnet. Um, I will mention this one, the, the, high, the largest one that we've created, I don't believe actually allows humans inside. Uh, what I've been told, and I think it's correct, is that it will actually cause the iron in your blood to become hot uh, and, and possibly cause damage. So I, I think that magnet is uh, off limits at the moment. But uh, we, at the lower, lower power magnets are used quite widely. So we're going to be trying to align these, ma these uh, hydrogen molecules by using this large magnet. You can see on this this kind of image here on the left, these are your hydrogen molecules. The arrow is kind of dictating where the magnet is pointing, so where the positive and negative are located. When not in a magnet, these are all oriented at random directions. Once we place it into a large magnet, they all orient either with the magnet or against the magnet. None of them will point in uh, left to right, if you will. And it just so happens that a small majority will be pointing with the magnet rather than against. So I've made up these numbers, but I think it get, gets the point across. Let's say 51% point with the magnet and 49% 40, point against the magnet. That's a difference of about 2%. 2% more pointing with the magnet. I mentioned there's a lot of hydrogen in the body. There's 4 times 10 to the 27th hydrogen molecules, give or take. That's 4 followed by 27 zeros. Just to give you an idea, a million is one followed by six zeros. So this is a lot more. Uh, I don't know the name of that number, but it is very, very big. This difference of 2% equates to 8 times 10 to the 25th. That's this number. If anyone knows the name of that number, um, please let me know. I don't. It's a huge number, though. And that's only based on a 2% difference. So we have an enormous number of these molecules in the body. And now they're aligning with this magnet. But there's one more problem. They don't just sit there. They rotate and they spin. They don't spin straight. They kind of wobble. So this is known as spin. And they spin kind of like a top. So if you were to spin a top on a table, as it, as it spins, it starts out really nice. And then slowly but surely starts to wobble. And all these atoms are wobbling around this magnetic field. The top it has gravity pushing against it. We have a magnet pushing against it. So just to give you an idea of that. The problem with this is they're all wobbling, but they're all wobbling differently. Some are wobbling in different uh, phases. So one might wobble left when the other one wobbles right. We need these things wobbling together. So in order to do that, we're going to knock them over. And when we knock them over, it's almost like hitting a reset button. If we knock them over, they're still spinning but they're all going to start spinning together. 
and they're all going to start at the same location and start spinning together. But to do that, to knock them over, we have to do it at a cert with a certain uh, finesse. The top spinning, it's kind of like picturing a kid on a swing. If you want the kid to swing faster, you need to push at the right moment. If you push, and you need to push at the right frequency, right? As the kid goes up, you wait, comes back, and as he's going back down and up, you're going to push. And then you push him, and he goes up, and he goes up a little higher, and he comes back, and then you push. If you push at the wrong time, it's not going to work. It's going to stop stop the kid from swing, swinging. So we need to interact with these molecules with the right frequency, and that frequency happens to be radio frequency for hydrogen molecules. So we're going to shoot a pulse of radio frequency electromagnetic light through the the, uh, the body and it's going to knock all, at 90 degrees we're going to push it sideways through the body it's going to knock all these molecules over and then they're going to slowly but surely come up together and what does this is we have the, what's called a coil this coil can be turned it's an electromagnetic coil it can be turned on to shoot a pulse in and then it can be reversed to take a pulse out so it's actually used to knock over the, the, the molecules, and it's also used to receive the information coming back from the, the molecules. And this coil, when it, when it shoots out and comes back, it makes a very loud noise because you're reversing this electromagnetic current. That's that clank, 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 clank sound that you're hearing whenever you're in an MRI. We're almost there. So we've created this magnet. We've oriented all these molecules in the right direction. We've knocked them over to get their spins going all together. But when we get the signal back, we have no clue where in the body it's coming from. We have a signal, but it's just from the entire body. We need to figure out how to locate this signal. This is where gradients come in. And a gradient creates a slope in the magnet. And this animation hopefully helps. This blue box represents the magnetic field. It's pointed to the right. And that's the body sitting in the magnetic field. But it's uniform. There's the mag same magnetic field throughout the whole body. A gradient applies a slightly changing field throughout the body. So here we have a little bit of a magnet, a little bit more of a magnet, a little bit more of a magnet, and all the way through till we have a whole lot of magnet at the end. The power of the magnet affects how fast those molecules spin. And therefore, it affects the frequency that you have to push them over in. So when we are at this specific slice, we have to fire, let's say it spins 10 times a second. We have to fire a frequency that matches that 10 times a second. And it will knock over all the molecules in the body that are spinning at 10 times a second. Well, it ha happens that only the ones within this little slice here are spinning that fast. These are spinning at 20 times. These are spinning at 50 times. These are spinning at 5 times. We shoot them down, we record that, and then we move this. And then we do it at 20, then we do it at 30, and we increase the, the uh, frequency that we shoot in and therefore change the location that we're measuring from. So these gradients allow us to locate where this information is coming from. And that's where we get these slices. So you can see a slice here on the right. This is one particular location uh, in the body. But the signal that we're measuring is it doesn't really come from this gradient. We're, we're interacting with the molecules based on the gradient, and then we're measuring something. The way that we measure that this is bone, and this is skin, and this is brain, and this is uh, cerebellum, and all this, the way that we can see all of this differentiation is be due to the relaxation of the molecules. We've knocked them over, and then they start to relax again and come back in line with the magnet. But depending on what type of tissue that they were in, whether they were in fat or muscle or water or bone, they come back at a different speed. And depending on what speed they come back, we're able to measure that and give it a value and therefore give it a grayscale color. When they come back faster, perhaps they're more gray. When they come back slower, they're more white. The fastest come back black, or maybe vice versa, depending on what type of imaging you're doing. So this relaxation is what gives us the tissue contrast. And these slices 
are simply two-dimensional photographs. That's what we're getting. We're getting two-dimensional photographs, but we're not using visible light. We're looking at the energy that's being released as these molecules relax and that shoots back out to these coils that record it, just like your camera records the light bouncing off of a leaf. It's just a much more confusing version of that. What's nice about these slices, though, is I can get thousands of these, and I can stack them up one on top of the other and get a three-dimensional view of the body. And that three-dimensional view of the body shows me all of the internals. So the pros of MRI, they sh should be clear by now. I, you know, hopefully your brain's hurting just a little bit, but not too much. But the pros of MRIs, we can see inside the body without having to really cut anything open. And we can see a lot of detail. We get terrific resolution of all sorts of tissue. You can see difference in uh, uh, delineation. You can see where tissues end and other tissues start. MRI is often considered the gold standard of imaging. Everything is compared to this. But it does have some downsides. It is prone to movement artifacts. If I put a body into this and I'm taking slices and I get the first slice and I get the second slice and then the individual moves, the third slice is going to be totally disassociated from the first two. So you need the subject to or the patient to be very uh, still. You need them not to move during this whole process. And the process can be long. For a knee, it takes anywhere between 38 minutes to an hour. So considering a whole body, you're looking at a several hour scan and they need not to move during that time. These MRIs are typically limited in spatial resolution, either to the amount of time spent. You can get more slices if you um, take longer time. Or the power of the magnet. The higher the power you have, the higher the resolution of the image. But the higher the power of the magnet, the more dangerous it is, the more expensive it is, and you have other factors involved in that. You're also not getting true color. And when you lose out on color, just as we talked about in the photographs, photographs have layers. There's a brightness layer, and there's three color layers. Those color layers aren't just to make pretty pictures. That's information. There's information within those layers. And when you don't have that, you've lost that information. So we don't have that. And then there are also, MRIs are considered indirect images. Right? We've had to tweak all this stuff. We've played with the molecules, and then we're recording things that the molecules are sending back to us. With a photograph, you're just recording the light directly bouncing off of that. You're not having to tweak any molecules or anything like that. So with that respect, MRIs are more indirect images than a photograph. But if you go deep enough into a photograph, you'll realize that a photograph itself is also somewhat indirect, uh, but less so than the MRI. And then finally, these things are expensive. A typical MRI machine costs a couple million dollars. You have to build out a special room for it. And you have to super cool it using liquid helium. And you have to do that all the time, which means your electric bill is very, very high. And if it ever breaks, it's a very expensive fix. So it does have some cons built into it. That said, I want to open up a couple cadavers now with you. The first cadaver is going to be a one developed using photographic slices. And the next three or four are going to be built using MRI slices. And hopefully you'll be able to see the difference there. Okay, so I've opened up Victor here. Victor is one of our four cadavers on the anatomage table. And he was built using photographic slices. So he was actually a real individual. We do have four cadavers, so you'll see we have, we're have we using Victor up here, the male Asian. There are three others that each had a different cause of death and therefore a unique anatomy in and of themselves. Uh, but what we're going to look at first is Victor's photographs. So over here on the right, this is a photographic slice. You'll notice there's an orange bar here. The orange bar represents where this uh, image is built into Victor. So this photo right here represents this slice of Victor. If I scroll down, I can go all the way through these images down to his toes. Whoop, there they are. And I can come all the way back up and I like to stop right at his liver. So his liver is easy to find, so I like to use that. What this allows me to do is first off, I get amazing resolution and true color, so I have that information available. But our team has also taken the time to actually outline each of these structures, so we can play quite a bit with this. I can peel away layers of skin, I can peel away layers of muscle, 
I can come down to where you have his now highlighted liver. It's highlighted because I have it selected here. This liver was built by using information from each of these slices that have been outlined as the liver. So if I scroll through it, you'll actually see each of those little slices as I go through the liver. Every structure you see on Victor, I can pull in his blood vessels, I can pull in all sorts of information on him. Um, everything you see was built using these photographs. And we have about half a millimeter resolution. We have all of this terrific information coming in strictly because it was a photograph. But you should note one particular downside, even though I haven't mentioned it yet. Simply, how does one obtain a photograph of someone to look like this? You can't just walk up to somebody on the street and take a picture of your iPhone and obtain an image like this. So Victor, when he passed away, and he actually died of leukemia, I can actually pull in his lymph nodes and you'll see these enormous lymph nodes. You can see his liver is enormous and his spleen as well over here is enormous. Um, when Victor passed away, he had signed up to be a part of this program that takes your body, submerges it in this blue goo you see around it, freezes it, and then proceeds to take an industrial grinder and grind away layers about every half a millimeter and taking a photograph. At the end of this process, Victor is turned to dust. There is no body left. But you have 2,000 photographs of Victor that can be loaded into a computer, segmented out, and rebuilt into a virtual version of Victor. And it's a phenomenal tool. On the MRI side, we have similar information. So first I'm going to start with a full body here. And we're going to get into a liver, some calf, and then we're going to do a brain tumor at the bottom. So first I want to point out, you can see the resolution here. It's 1.25 millimeters and by 1.25 by 1.2. It's three-dimensional, so you have three measurements. Let's go ahead and look at that. Okay, so the first thing you should notice is this has clearly been cut and pasted. You have a missing neck. You have all these different lines going through with differing color tone and all that. The reason for that is going into an MRI, if you're doing a full body, it's limited by either the size of the MRI. You've got to be able to fit a full body in there. Two, it's limited by the individual's uh, comfort level for being inside of a tight space or so whether or not they're claustrophobic. And three, the time. If you did a full body MRI, you'd be looking at almost a full day inside of a scanner. And a full day inside of a scanner where you can't move. You can't pee, you can't eat, you can't talk, you can't move. So what they did here was take multiple regional scans and then paste them together. So very simply. I can pull in his slices and you can see all this detail and information. Clearly you can see the, the muscle. You can see the bone is black here. These little guys are, are uh, blood vessels around the edge. You get a lot of information, but there's no color. We don't have that color information. And what you'll notice is as we look through Victor here, there's kind of empty space. We're missing a neck, obviously. The neck is not there. But also looking through his skin, there's empty space around that. One of the reasons for that is the fact that you're missing information. You don't have the full story. So if we come through here, I can scroll through his, his images and everything. We can keep going through that. And you'll have, you can see, it looks like discs and everything, but you'll notice actually the bone is, is not there. The bone is listed as black here. And, and we'll talk about that actually on the, um, the calf muscle as well. But what that's indicating is we have a, a limited number of um, spans. You have black to white and then everything in between. You only have so many color choices, right? So many grays you can pick from. This, not, this has been a numerically assigned the number zero. The white's been numerically assigned likely the number 255. So you have zero to 255 different values you can put in. And from zero to one or one to two, there's very minor changes. So usually you jump a few uh, gaps there. But zero represents empty space when you go to render it. So you'll actually see there's a lot of empty space there. And that's listed at different types of tissue. 
So the whole body offers tremendous information, but it, you already see it has some limitations there. So next we're going to look at the liver. And this I actually think may have actually come from the same individual. Uh, so let's go ahead and pull in his slices. And again, you'll see a really nice image here. You have clear designation of where the, the muscle is. You can see kind of a vertebrae there. I think this is a liver right here. If I scroll down, I think you can even see, yeah, there's, a, there's the kidneys. You get a lot of information here. But looking at the image, again, it's a little strange looking. There's a lot of empty space. There's missing information. So let's go ahead and do that same cut, see if we can find something interesting here. So there I think is the liver, there you have a kidney. Scrolling through, you get a really neat sensation uh, going through this. And then last, or second to last, we're gonna pull in a upper calf. Same resolution again, same age. Again, I think these came from the same individual even though I don't have evidence of that. And the first thing you should note here is the vasculature. You can clearly see that those blood vessels amazingly. It's almost as though you're looking through the skin which you kind of are in this in this case. You'll also notice the bones again are black and very telling there. That would be a tibia. I don't see anything there, it's empty space. So again, you're getting that same missing information. So let me go ahead and cut through that, see what we find. We can see a joint. We got a lot of very interesting uh, information at the joint, but you'll see on either side of the joint, there's missing bone. You're seeing through that section there. Whereas if it were a photograph, you would have the ability to actually uh, cut through and see the inside of that. And then finally, we're going to pull in my favorites. We're going to end with a brain tumor. This has better resolution. We're down to about 0.5 millimeters, almost equal to our photographic cadaver. The big catch on this, though, is it is just the head, and they probably had to use a slightly higher power powered magnet and load this in. Okay, so this individual, first off, should look a little bit strange, which that's normal. Here's the slices. You can already see it's a very nice, subtle, smooth transition between different types of tissue. So you have a lot of grayscale images and um, alterations between those. You also notice that she has these funny bumps in her head. Those are electrical leads, so they were measuring brain activity during this um, scan. And then you also notice there is a missing piece of skull. So we're going to figure out why that is in just a second. So if I scroll through here, you will notice a very large mass, which happens to be a tumor. So I can go ahead and make that same cut I've been making. Let's look inside, and you'll see that brain tumor floating in space there. Let's go ahead and take the bottom off as well, so we can kind of compare these two images. There we go. So now you have the slice here and you have the three-dimensional view on the left. Already you can see, again, there's that missing space, but let's change how we rendered this. Basically, what information did we take to create the 3D image? We can alter that. So I can change what I'm looking at. Let's look at soft tissue. Let's look at a different type of transparency. Let's look at the soft tissue, a different variety. Here you actually lose information on the tumor. You can't see that tumor uh, through that slice. If you go through another transparent, and then you go through grayscale, which actually this should look quite similar to that, aside from the fact that we've uh, lost the tumor information. The last one we have is the ultra high quality rendering, and I love this view. The reason I love this view is because it can highlight blood vessels better than anything I've ever seen. So here you have kind of capillaries and blood vessels and all sorts of things residing within the body. We've also attributed color to these things. What I can then do is peel away the lower resolution blood vessels little by little. So it's pruning away smaller ones to bigger ones. And what you're left with at the end is the blood vessel surrounding the tumor. You actually are not left with the tumor. You can't see it. If you look inside, there's just gray space. But you see the blood vessels that the tumor was able to create for itself using what's called angiogenesis. It's known that tumors can build their own blood vessels because they are hungry and they are demanding and they build blood vessels to feed themselves. So here you can see exactly that concept and you can rotate it around a little bit. But again, you don't have the tumor. It's non-existent in this MRI image. It's just the blood vessels around it. So hopefully, let me go ahead and go back to our slides here. Hopefully, 
this talk has both confused you in the sense that we don't know what light is yet we can use it, but also kind of enlightened, um, enlightened you uh, to how these MRIs function, what it is that you're looking at, how it could trick you, uh, why it's so good and what's, what's some limitations of it. And uh, hopefully the next time you get an MRI, you go with a smile on your face, realizing that you have a bit of better idea of what's happening. Anyway, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, this has been, a, as I mentioned, a um, long process in the making. And I'm very, very, very excited that I was able to do this. Uh, and I do hope that you came away having enjoyed this.